start up the torque amplifier. As you can see, the drums are rotating in opposite directions. Then I will start the time drive to run the integrated bit and the table. Okay? Yep, I'm ready. So what happens is, I'm going to pull out from the side of the road. And as I pull out from the side of the road, this pen will start to lift off the side. I'm going to start to travel some level of distance. And I put my foot on the throttle, and the engine increases in speed, and the car is now beginning to accelerate. And I've started off gently, because there's a gentle curve here, and can you see that that wheel is just beginning to turn? And everybody see this first wheel, the little wheel, the other big one, is beginning to turn. And now, and now I'm having to turn this wheel a bit faster because the car is now travelling down the street. So I'm doing roughly 10 miles an hour. I'm now doing about 12 miles an hour. And I'm constantly accelerating because I've got my foot not very hard on the throttle but I'm now beginning to catch up with the traffic. Now I've caught up with the traffic and I need to take my foot off the throttle but not all the way off. So you will see that this graph starts to level off. So as I lift my foot off that throttle the car is beginning to reach constant speed. So I've nearly reached constant speed. You can see that the angle of this graph has now reached the plateau. I don't need to change that anymore, and I've reached constant speed. So I'm probably travelling about 30 miles an hour down the street now. What's the number on that? It says three. So I've travelled roughly 300 metres. So I'm travelling at uh, say 30 miles an hour, I'm mix, mixing my units, it, 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 for the purpose of the demonstration, I'm mixing the units a bit, it's not a matter of here. So I'm following the car, I'm following the, there's a car in front of me, and um, I'm following close behind me. But fortunately, that car indicates, and I see he's just about to turn off. So in a moment, when he's finally started to turn the corner, I can put my foot down a little bit harder, and I can begin to accelerate. So can you see that my velocity, my speed, is beginning to increase? And I'm quite a gentle driver by the looks, so I'm not some kind of boy racer by the looks. And that's that. So the guy's begun to turn the corner. It's picking up speed, and I'm actually covering more ground now. So that is not now a straight line, but that's beginning to curve up as my velocity increases. So I put my foot down, and the car's now really starting to accelerate a lot. So I'm doing about 35, uh, yeah, 35 miles an hour. This disc has now reached quite near the edge of the disc. I'm accelerating harder. I'm probably at the peak of my acceleration now. And I've just noticed I'm coming up to the speed limit. So I better just take my foot off the gas a little bit. And I'm beginning to reach, say, 40 miles an hour. So I take my foot gently off the, the throttle. and I reach roughly 40 miles an hour. Now I look at the distance. I think, oh my goodness, I'm coming up to an intersection, and oh no, I've just missed the lights. So after I coast along for a little while, I take my foot right off the gas, and I begin to let the velocity, can you see I'm turning this in the opposite direction now? And the velocity is beginning to come down now, so that the car naturally is slowing down. However, I'm approaching the lights, so I actually start to need to apply the brake. And we were talking about progressive braking, so I actually actively now move my foot from the throttle to the brake, 
And can you see now the curve is significantly steeper? And I'm coming up to the lights. And I'm having to turn this quicker because I'm braking. So it's not just the fact that the car is coasting into a halt, but I'm actually actively braking. And as I carry on in time, the speed is falling quite quickly, and this is actually starting to move to the middle of the disc. And I'm actually not keeping up well enough quite here, but hey, here we go. Now, we were talking about um, driving style. Um, if I did keep my brake on hard for the whole time that I was slowing down the traffic lights, eventually I would get to a place where um, the, the, the car would just suddenly stop, and then everybody's eggs and uh, washing up liquid would be thrown to the front of the car. I'm actually not turning this fast enough, but hey. Um, so uh, I'm following the line here, I, this is a slight human in and out. This is a good example of human error, because uh, I'm not concentrating on my job. But I'm actually now taking my foot off the brake. I'm not stopping braking, but I'm doing what's called progressive braking. We've talked about that in your, your, your driving lessons, that um, we're taught not to bring the car suddenly to a halt, but at just at the last few moments, we let the car coast to a halt under a, a, a modest amount of uh, a modest amount of braking. So um, we're coming up to the traffic lights now. The, the little wheel is getting to be quite slow, and this graph should be flattening off. It's everybody able to see that that little wheel is hardly turning, and the graph is flattening off. And if I could only operate this without doing too much talking, you would see that eventually I'm going to get to zero speed. I perhaps braked a little bit earlier. <laughs> and then I've just about reached zero speed. So I'm, I wonder how far we travelled in. How far did we go today? Right. Let's turn it off and have a look. Was that 21 or 22? It's halfway between 21 and 22. So, we've just travelled, um, say, 2,200 metres or something, uh, something like that, a couple of kilometres. And um, we can see that the very point, the very top part of the sphere corresponds to what? Just under 22? Have we got 9? 22.5. It's just if that, that dark line, does that correspond to that about there? It's about there. It's just about 21, 22 um, kilometer, uh, uh, meters. So, quite with a, quite a simple little bit of mathematics, we've actually done what your sat nav is doing naturally all of the time. It's actually calculated that it's going to take me that long to get from here into Canterbury. But it hasn't done the calculation of Canterbury up to the A2 or along the A2 onwards into London. So, you need a number of different stages. Those stages can all be done with the one single table, as long as we have all the lines on the graph, and that's what your sat nav does. If we want to find out more information about this, we would then need to analyze the rate of braking. And I know one or two of you who've done a little bit of um, uh, A-level maths, you will know that this is what we call a first order um, equation. And if you have another table, you can do a second order equation. If you have third and fourth, you can do more complicated equations. Um, why this guy had 18 tables? We have yet, because of our brains, I mean, all of us can think in, in two dimensions. Um, uh, I'm sure all of us work, uh, we're all 3D people, and even if you introduce time, you can think in four dimensions. If you can think of parallel units, you can think in five dimensions. But I think when you get up to 18 dimensional space, I think even Einstein was having difficulty. Um, so we're not entirely sure why he needed to go that way, but we are not mathematicians. We are just hobbyists who have um, use of um, nuts and bolts and washers and gears and teeth, and we've made a copy of this machine that is in the um, Science Museum, and we know it works, and we put our hands on it, and the, there were aspects of the machine that we looked at, and we thought, well, that's how a, a torque amplifier works, that's how the table works, that's how the programming works, that's how we can have uh, a one-to-one -one relationship between the movement of of the wheel here and the movement there. If we wanted to have uh, real figures in, we could have a 10 to 1 relationship and we could do a couple of tens of miles or hundreds of miles or tens of thousands of miles out into space. Millions of miles, if you like. What Ian and I didn't realize, uh, was it this morning? This morning, yeah. You're this right. morning, we, we, we've looked at um, the, the machine that is in the science. Is that the right way up? Is it that way? Way up. 
But it's that, it's that way up, isn't it? I can't see from this side. Um, we looked at this machine and we have made it exactly as the real thing. But there is a slight mystery as to why there's some extra gearing here. And we looked at it and we thought, well, it's, it's prototypical, that's what was there, but we don't understand why. Now, when you put in real figures, we can see that the area under the cloth is going to add up and add up and add up. And what we realised this afternoon was that if you actually add up uh, one metre per second, two metre per second, and, uh, and so on, and carry on, you're going to get to some quite large figures. What we then discovered was that this pen would have travelled right up here, and we'd need an A2 sheet of paper. This four and a half to one merely means that we can fit it all on an A4 sheet, and that's all yeah. it's for. And it's that eureka moment, so you go, oh. <laughs> it's so easy once you know, but until we built it, you don't know that your VDU screen, this is like a squeezing all of your information onto a small dashboard screen, or a medium-sized tablet, or a laptop, or something bigger like a projector. This is a scale factor. And it enables us to deal with extremely large figures or extremely small figures. All of us can multiply by 10, but we want to see it written on a piece of paper that we can take off the machine and run away with. Um, we, we've done it before. Um, we, we, there's, there's another little, little thing here. We've done it before. And we now know that this machine is completely repeatable. Uh, it, it's just worked perfectly well. I wasn't following the line very accurately, but we know that it would be exceedingly accurate because there's no reason for it to not accurate. And this is what the military found. This is what the people who were designing um, nuclear bombs found. That in actual fact, the maths that they've been trying to find the solutions for actually worked. They were actually able to um, design uh, these nuclear uh, weapons. They were able to track um, German uh, battleships. They were able to backtrack and find out where V1s were being launched for. And many, many other things besides. And they all wanted them to appear on modest pieces of paper, rather than a piece of paper that's the size of the room, and that's what these scale factors are for. So that's, that was a surprise to us. Um, I think I've, I've mentioned uh, accuracy, and Tom's mentioned it as well, and we've got every faith in this machine because it's too stupid to get it wrong. <laughs> Honestly, it, it is literally only a few Meccano's gears and cogs that are coupled together and out the answer pops. So it is too stupid to have errors. But all scientists like to know how accurate uh, something is. And that's a natural thing, because if you make uh, a small error in some calculations, if there are other calculations that are reliant upon it, there is going to be a problem. Why would need pi calculated at 512 decimal places or more? How many trillion is it, Tom? Um, I, 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 yeah, I, I, I can't understand it. It is so-called the most boring book in the world, the book of pi to how many decimal places. But um, we trust this machine, but scientists really want to have accuracy. It's not just roughly right. How accurate is it? So there is a test, that, and we're going to set this up now. There is a test, and what we're going to do is to ask you to look at the books and have a little chat amongst yourselves, ask me some questions if you like. Ian's going to reprogram it. Yeah, he's, gonna, he's got his visual basic going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but what we're going to do is we're going to actually ask it to do a bit of uh, differentiation, uh, sorry, integration of a differential equation. Now, some clever dicky in the maths department, if there are any of you there, the equation <laughs> for a circle um, is that uh, if, if you uh, integrate uh, this second order differential to a negative um, figure, and this figure z here is actually the radius of the circle, then you can actually get x and y uh, to be driven by this machine, and it will actually produce a perfect circle. So the solution to this um, is a circle. And it's a reasonably famous bit of maths. I, I, I've come across it before. Um, and it's just a few little changes on here, and we'll get an answer to... We've already, done, uh, we've already looked at a first-order equation. We're now going to look at a second-order equation, because this has got squares in it. Those are people who are used to curves and parabolas will understand that anything with a curve in it is going to be more than a simple linear equation. Ian's going to set the machine up. And the problem is, a bit like your spirograph, if you um, wobble your pen in the, the little hole when your spirograph gear wheels go round and round. And if you, if you have a very large hole, for instance, the hole in a piece of paper here, and a little tiny pen, your pen is going to waver around. 
So that's an inaccuracy, isn't it? And you're going to find that when you do your spiral graph and it comes all the way back, because of your little hole, it may not just come back to exactly where the spiral graph started. Um, the fact that spiral graph is made with gears, with, with um, uh, discrete teeth, means it can't make a mistake. If the spiral graph was just made with rubber wheels, the rubber wheels could slip, and you will definitely get the, well, find that the line will not come back to the start. So what we're going to do now is, um, uh, I have to say, um, we've done this once, uh, we've fiddled with the machine, and we don't know what the answer will be, but we're going to hope that the machine can make a circle and hopefully come back to the start. This is one we, we did uh, a little while ago. We're going to do it again in front of you, and we don't know, but we trust that the machine is too stupid to get the answer wrong. And this is not a fiddle, Ben, this is actuality. Um, it, it may be there's a bit of slip, He's going to reset the machine back to the start. And it takes about 10 or 15 minutes to do it, because um, we've slowed the machine down so that you can see it, it doesn't wear itself out. And this is probably the speed that the machine actually operated at the time. Um, so in a minute, when Ian started off, he'll tell you. And have a little look. But I know you've only got limited time, so please do enjoy the books that the department will actually put out as well. They're historically significant, there is an explanation. And my voice won't be any more <laughs> So, has anybody got any questions? I'm happy to take. Yeah, go on. <laughs> right. Um, if you use the piece of wood, the wood would have a grain to it. And the grain would mean that in some direction of the turn table, it would pick up the grip much better than it was otherwise. We could have used MDF, um, but uh, I believe that... Uh, Ian, you, you tell me more about the right...